Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good afternoon. We're happy to have James Lee tell us about the Margulis Expander. I'll tell you what I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> that, no, that makes sense. Um, no, so I was teaching a course on spectral graph theory in the spring, and uh, I showed all the students that a random regular graph is an expander, and I want to do an explicit construction. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, you hear a lot of things about explicit construction of expander graphs and the zigzag product, but I want to do something that was really sort of, I was hoping I could do something that was elementary enough that you could do it in one lecture and be completely understood. Uh, and I remember that actually Ryan O'Donnell wrote this blog entry a few years ago that upset Avi, uh, Avi Vigderson because Ryan said, you know, everybody says that the zigzag expanders are the first one whose analysis can be understood, but actually the Gabor Galil analysis is just a couple, few pages of analysis. And so, and then, okay, Avi got upset because Avi said nobody ever said that they were the first understandable examples and so on. Uh, so then I went and looked at the Gabor Galil uh, analysis, and unfortunately, uh, it is, it's elementary, but there's three or four pages of calculations which don't seem amenable to a lecture. Uh, and then there is a follow-up paper of Jimbo and Moroka where it's, the proof, I guess, is more elementary because there are no complex numbers, so, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and then e even in this sort of the expander survey of uh, Hori, Lineal, and Vigderson, they say, you know, here's the analysis of Margulis graphs. It's a few pages, but it's still subtle and mysterious. Uh, uh, and so it just turns out that if you take uh, various pieces from various places and put them together in the right way, then the proof is almost, it's almost disillusioningly simple, tr almost trivial, which is kind of, which is kind of, yeah. You always, when you think about expanders, you think that there's always something deep lying behind there, like some kind of exponential sum or some product theorem or something in representation theory. So the point today is that uh, hopefully everything, almost everything I say is like, it's very easy to follow. So this will be like 25, 30 minutes at a very leisurely pace. Okay, so let me just say who are the, what's going on here. So in 1973, Margulis presented the first example of an explicit family of expanders. And then, um, but this, the analysis used, quote unquote, deep facts from representation theory. Uh, and then Gabor Galil in, I guess their journal paper was in 81, their Fox paper was in 79, gave uh, an, an elementary proof using just sort of essentially a bunch of inequalities with complex numbers. And then uh, Jimbo and Maroka uh, in 85, but in, actually this was in Fox 79, I think this was in Fox 83, gave a even more elementary proof, as I said, with no complex numbers, but it's slightly more complicated. Okay, uh, so today I want to present just what I, seems to be a proof that has almost no ideas in it. Okay, um, so let me remind you what's going on. We have a graph uh, and a subset. Let's define the expansion constant of this subset with respect to the graph. And by the way, of course, ask me questions at any time. Uh, and I, also, I don't claim anything here is new. So, uh, and I heard a noise when I said that. I think they stopped filming, but uh, okay. So the expansion constant of the subset S is just the number of S edges that cross from S to its complement divided by the size of S. And then let's define also overloading notation a bit, H of G to be the expansion constant of G. So look over all subsets size at most half of the expansion of that subset. Okay, so that's the expansion constant for G. And let's also define the, the corresponding notion for functions. So if f is a function from the vertices, let's say to the complex numbers, for the sake of what I'm doing here, then the Rayleigh quotient, is that correct? Right. Russ, it's not Rayleigh, it's Rayleigh, according to Russ. I mean, according to the world, that's the correct <laughs> pronunciation. But uh, All right. Okay. 
here's the, the Rayleigh quotient, and then finally the second eigenvalue of the Laplacian of this graph is just the minimum of this Rayleigh quotient over all functions at sum to zero. Okay, so this is the setup, and then let's define what an expander family is. So an, an expander family is a sequence of deregular graphs um, such that the second eigenvalues are uniformly bounded, or equivalently, the expansion constants of the graph are uniformly bounded. Okay. So the goal today is to present an, uh, an elementary family of graphs with an elementary analysis showing their expanders. Okay. Uh, and I need one thing for this to be elementary. So I assume everybody sort of believes the following uh, connection between eigenvalues and expansions, but let me state it in a way that I need it. And again, the, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that you know this, sort of that this seems like so natural to you that you wouldn't question it. So, because that, that makes the proof, you know, in order for the things I said about triviality to be true, that has to, that has to hold. So, uh, what is this? So we have a graph G, a subset of the vertices U. Okay, this graph can be, it doesn't have to be finite. So this graph could be an infinite graph. And what I'm saying here, uh, graph G, U, and we have a function from the vertices so I need the complex numbers here, let's say, so the complex numbers. Of course, it doesn't matter for this, it's, uh, for what I want to say. Um, such that the support of f, so all the, place, all the places where f are non-zero is contained inside u. In fact, it's not clear that I need this, this set u. So let's just say it this way. I have a graph and a function. Um, and, uh, and the function is bounded in in L2, so f u squared is less than infinity, then there exists a finite subset of the vertices, and in fact, this subset is a subset of the support of f. Okay, so this subset has nodes uh, on which, contains only nodes on which f takes a non-zero value. Okay, so there exists a subset uh, who is such as the expansion of this subset is at most square root 2 times the Rayleigh quotient of f. Okay? So given any function on the graph which is bounded in L2, there exists a subset of the support of f whose expansion is at most some is bounded in terms of the Rayleigh quotient. Okay. All right. So now we are ready to, to start the, the proof of the, the theorem. So I'll state a theorem in a second. Uh, first, let me just introduce, let me sort of state a, the main technical lemma, okay, which is very simple. So suppose S and T are maps from a plane to itself, defined by, so let's say, S of XY is maps XY to X plus Y, Y, and T of XY is the same thing in the other coordinate, right? so it's X, Y plus X. And I'll also need the inverses of these functions, so let me just write them for sake of not having to think about what they are. Okay, here are the inverse of these functions. So I have S, T, S inverse, and T inverse. And um, let me define a, a, a graph based on these functions. So the graph will be, have vertex set, which is the integer lattice, and the edges of the graph will be the following. We'll connect a vertex x, y to, um, let's connect it to s, x, y, t, x, y, s inverse x, y, and t inverse x, y. Okay? So this graph has degree at most four. The origin, for instance, has, either you can think of it as having four self loops if you want. The origin has, has no adjacent things. And now here's the main. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. 
I planted that so I could check if you were paying attention. So, okay. Um, okay, so now here's the main technical theorem. Well, let's call it a lemma. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we want to, I'm, I'm going to prove sort of that there's, you know, that there's a sequence of expander graphs, so we need something, something to expand. So this, this graph is going to be our, our expanding object, and here's the main proof, the main lemma. For any subset uh, of the integers that doesn't contain zero, okay, so right, remember zero doesn't have any neighbors, so let's, let's admit zero. Um, the number of edges from A to its complement is at least the size of A, okay? So in, in some sense, this is an infinite graph, but in some sense, this infinite graph is expanding, okay? This is the claim. Uh, and, and, and this is the really, this is the expander part of the whole proof, okay? So let's prove this. The proof is really simple, so here's the proof. Uh, so let's, here's the plane, this is the plane. Let's break it up into four quadrants, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. And I want, I want to partition the plane except for the origin. So I'm going to, so I'll, inc I'll include the y-axis, or the, sorry, the x-axis in Q1. I don't know if this notation makes any sense, but okay. So just to be clear, Q1 is the set of pairs x, y such that x is bigger than 0 and y is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, that's Q1. It's the quadrant with the positive x-axis. And similarly for Q2. Q2 is in fact just the 90 degree rotation of Q1 and Q3 is 180 degree rotation of Q1 and so on. Okay, so these four sets partition the plane, I mean the integer lattice minus, uh, minus the origin. And I'll define a sub i to be Q, to be the intersection of A with the ith quadrant. So I'll break this out into quadrants, and then, okay, so I have to remember not to write in this no man's land over here. Here's the claim that I'm going to prove that the number of edges from A1 to the complement intersected with the first quadrant. So these are edges that, that go from A1 outside of A1 all inside the first quadrant. This is at least the size of A1. Okay, and if I prove that, I'm, I've proved the lemma because just apply it separately to A1, A2, A3, and A4. And really, it's without loss. This graph is completely, uh, this graph is invariant under rotations by 90 degrees. So right, I have the, you know, if I flip or exchange the coordinates, the graph is invariant. So I really just need to prove for the first quadrant. Everything is symmetric. And here's the proof for the first quadrant. It's, uh, okay, it's simple enough to do here. The first thing is that, if I apply S or T to A1, then I stay inside the first quadrant. That's straightforward. I have non, I have, you know, non-negative coordinates. I add to them, I keep my non-negative coordinates. Good. And, uh, and the second claim is that actually they're disjoint. And the reason they're disjoint is because if I draw the line Y equals X, then S maps everything above this line, and T maps everything below this line. And if you think about the boundary, so points here will get mapped by, which one changes the Y coordinate? Will get mapped by T up to the diagonal. And of course, they'll also get mapped to themselves by, by S. Uh, and, and points, but points on the diagonal get mapped off the diagonal. Okay, so it's really the case that their images are disjoint. The image of S and T in this quadrant are disjoint. Because again, S maps everything uh, you know, up here, including this line to here, and T maps everything here to here. Okay. Okay, so that's the end of the proof, right? Because that implies, uh, let me do it here. By the way, tell me if it, it's, if it stops. I won't write over here anymore, but, because uh, that implies that, okay. That implies that this equals this, but S and T are bijection, so this is just twice a1. So, you know, when I apply S and T, the set gets bigger by a factor of two, so I have at least A1 edges coming out of A1. Okay. So that's the end of the proof of the claim and the end of the proof of the lemma. So it's really just that, I mean, it's really just that you take a set and sort of, okay, 
half the set goes up here, and sort of another copy of the set goes down here. And that happens in every one of the four quadrants. So you get, an ex so you get twice as many vertices, so you get an, ex you get an expander. OK. So th I claim that that's it. That's the, that's, that's, I'm, I mean, the proof is not finished. We haven't even defined a family of graphs yet. But this is the main technical part of the proof. And in fact, this is the part that corresponds to the mysterious subtle argument uh, in all the other proofs that involve a few pages of Fourier analysis. Just this thing. OK. Uh, so now let's see what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. So no, no. So now, of course, we haven't. But I, but you'll see that this is everything else is now just sort of, hand, you know. I mean, is a uh, it's like parlor tricks. But not, not there's nothing deep that happens now. What's that? So so the first thing, all the proofs have some kind of fundamental flaw. So if if you try to use discrete Fourier transform, then Everything has to be messy. If you use the continuous Fourier transform, then uh, and you don't use the discrete Chigrin inequality, then this proof looks much harder than it actually is. I think that's the essence of it. Although, could argue that it's uh, yeah, that's that's essentially why it's yeah. So okay, all right. So let's uh, sure. Chigrin, or even if you just. I mean, now you, you prove the combinatorial expansion. Yeah. If you stick to the combinatorial expansion. OK, so may, maybe you'll say at some point there's something subtle that happens. So that's not, at some point, we'll have to pass to, uh, we'll have to pass to functions, not sets. Just because, basically, just because if you take the Fourier transform of a set, you, you, don't, you won't get a set in the, in, the, in the Fourier basis. But OK, so I said, now I said Fourier like eight times. So it seems like something complicated is going to happen, but it's not true. Uh, OK, so let me, so is this OK? OK. So let me define, OK, so we have the infinite family, infinite graph here. So let me define a finite family of graphs. And we just the most obvious thing you could think of, which is just take everything mod n. That's the infinite family of graphs. Uh, so OK, so the vertex set is just going to be discrete torus. Okay. And the edge set. Now you have to be a little careful. Uh, the edge that's going to be these edges plus the neighbor edges. Then just uh, so the edge set are th is x y gets is adjacent to x plus minus one y, x y plus minus one, x plus minus y y. So these are the s edges and x. Okay. That's the graph. And now let's even state the main theorem here. Theorem lambda 2. OK. I'm not, there exists a C such that for all n, lambda 2 of gn is bigger than C. That's the main theorem. OK. So uh, all right. So now let's prove it. OK. I'll keep the discrete trigger in quality. We don't need it. But. OK. So now you, now, OK, so people might take issue with the part of this part of the proof. But I, I claim that this actually makes the proof less uh, interesting. So, so let me, uh, so I'm going to want to use the, the continuous sort of the, to, the two torus. OK. And I'm going to. Think about the Hilbert space of functions here. So this is the space of all functions from the torus to the complex numbers such that the two norm is bounded. OK. Right. So again, I mean, the two torus is just right, the unit square with the sides identified. OK. That's the two torus. Uh, and now, let me define, the, I'm, this is just a number. There's not going to be any operator here. But lambda 2, in the analogous way, to be the minimum over functions here of, OK, so it should take f minus f composed with t, f minus f composed with, sorry, s and t, and subject to the constraint that when you integrate f over the torus equals 0. So this is the second eigenvalue of the, of the torus with this strange s and t. But just 
This is just a number. Yeah. Which means two things? <laughs> oh, yeah, so this is a typesetting issue that I never, I just encountered now. Uh, I just, my blackboard T looks really bad, it looks like a pie, so I wasn't sure how to, I see. Okay, so let's, I guess we've already used, so let's get, let's replace T by something else. Script T is dangerous. How does one do a script? That's a J. All right. Let's see. Oh, the other direction. Like this? That looks like a. All right. I'll, I'm going to make up a symbol. Okay. Math cal T. Is that? All right. I'm not sure I can. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll use the blackboard bowl. That's a good. Okay. It's, it looks, uh, I mean, it's, this, it's not, not going to need to use the notation more than for a few seconds. Okay, it looks like a pie. Everybody has to get over this fact. I apologize. Uh, all right, just, you know, if you, have, if you have bad eyesight like me, then just squint and it looks better. Okay, uh, right. So here's the, this is just a number. This is not second eigenvalue or anything. I'm just using it for analogy. Um, okay, and here's the second main lemma which is that the second and final main lemma, that there exists an epsilon such that for all n, lambda 2 of gn is at least lambda 2 of the torus with these s and t operators. Okay, so, ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, so this should be reassuring because it implies that there's, we're not going to be using any number theory in our analysis of this object, right? You, you could look at this, you know, x plus y, y plus x, oh, this is somehow using the pseudorandom nature of the primes with respect to, I don't know, okay. But, but if we replace it by the torus, then there's really no, the modulus n has no effect. So it really just, and it's nice, it tells you why the graphs are all expanders because they're essentially just converging to the torus, okay. So, uh, so let me prove this. The proof is very simple. Uh, and again, I claim that sort of this is, you should be happy to see this because this means that nothing, you know, once you're here, there's nothing tricky going on. There's no number theory at some point, right? Okay. Uh, so what's the proof? Um, so take any function from the vertex set of this graph Gn, say, to the real line, or here it's fine to take it to the real line, okay. Because um, I, I guess I defined it in terms of complex numbers. It doesn't, the, it doesn't matter, okay. Um, such that the sum is equal to zero. Okay, and now I just want to ex define an extension of this to the torus, and I'm going to define it in the simplest possible, I'll define it in a very simple way at least, okay. So here's the torus, uh, I can put Zn on the torus as like a, you know, I can put the grid lines corresponding to sort of mod n, and then, uh, so I want to define some extension of f to the whole torus. So I think about my, ver my graph is sitting inside the torus, I want to ex define this extension. So suppose that, let's see, okay. Suppose that I have some square with corners u1, u2, u3, u4, and I have some z in the middle here, and I want to ex define the extension to this point z. So you can do this in any sufficiently nice way you want, okay? You just interpolate. I guess the cleanest way to do it is something like, like this. So I'll explain what this says in a second. So I'm just going to write it as an average of the four points. How am I writing the average? Well, here it looks like the L infinity norm looks nicely. So basically, for every point, I just look at the L infinity, the sort of the maximum of the x and y distances to the four corners, and I use those for the weights on the f. And now it has a nice property that if I look at a point here, it, the extension only depends on u4 and u3, because there's no weight corresponding to u1 and u2. So in fact, it is consistent along all the, this consistently defines the extension f, okay? This is not so important. This is just some sort of, you know, it's kind of define f, right? Sort of, you know, define f. Playing at all. 
if you are down there. So here, the infinity norm to u1 should be 1. So the coefficient of u1 goes away. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, right. You can generally take any smooth function that vanishes when you, OK, you can. This is not, OK. So now we just have to, now I just want to prove that, that the sort of the Rayleigh quotient for f tilde is at most the Rayleigh quotient for f. Okay, so we need to verify. So let's first verify that f integrates to zero. That's straightforward. Just by the symmetry, when you integrate, you pick up every corner with the same weight, and the sum of the f's is zero. So that's zero. That's that's easy. In fact, hopefully everybody remembers s and t. Uh, the second property I claim is that integral f squared over the torus is at least some constant times n squared times the sum of f u squared. I claim this. And this is, again, very simple. Take any square, say take the maximum corner, and take a little box around it, you know, a box of side length 1 8. Then in here, the, the integral of the square of f tilde will be proportional to the f of u, f of u 1 squared. So, OK. And, and the, the volume of the little box is a, is a constant time over n squared. So when you integrate f tilde in the little box, you pick up this, the maximum corner at least. And so sum over all the squares, you get this kind of thing. All right. So then that last one we need to verify is that, is that f, feel free to argue with me at any point about whether this is elementary. But hopefully all these things is just really like, you know, OK. It's very, all right. So then the last point is to prove that this is at most a constant times times that. This is, again, very easy. Yes, thank you. OK, so what's the reason for this? Well, take any, take any square and any other square. And suppose I have z here. And up here is s of z. OK? So now, uh, basically, I want to say that whenever, whenever the torus has to pay over here, this sum over here will also have to pay. Okay? So how do you do that? Well, the first thing is just to notice that in the graph, uh, any one of, so there are eight points here corresponding to, the, corresponding to the eight corners. Any one of these points can reach any other point in the graph in at most five steps. So you, know, you might have to take s somewhere and then take an edge to get back here and then come up here. But in at most five steps, any point here can reach any point here. This is the only place, by the way, where we're going to use the where we use the fact that the that we put these edges in there. It's just to make the graph look like a torus. So what it means is that so now I want to say that say this distance is say f tilde is, is has a difference of delta between here and here. I just want to say that there exists at least one corner there exists at least two corners whose whose distance is at least you know delta over four. Okay, and the reason for that is just that well. Suppose all of these corners are within delta over 4, and all of these are within delta over 4. Well, this, the value of f tilde is a convex combination of the corners. So that means that the value of f tilde here and here is also, also within delta over 4. So, so, we've, okay. so, so there must be two corners that differ a lot. And since all the corners are connected by a path of at length at, length at most 5, some edge in this sum has to pay for this difference. Okay? Uh, and Everything I wrote here is correct, except for the fact that I want, um, when you integrate, this only has volume 1 over n squared. So you have to pay it. You only get 1 over n squared. OK? So I claim that's the, and again, I, I basically I claim that, that this, this lemma was trivial. Like, I mean, you just extend it to f and just observe that it holds. And now, um, OK, good. So now the proof, uh, now we're just left to show that this thing is bigger than zero. So let me, first let me do it, and then I'll explain it. Okay, so the proof really only has um, about one minute left in it. Modulo the explanation. So what I'm going to use now for the final step is the Fourier transform, the classical Fourier transform from the from the torus to uh, this. So, okay, so by L2 
Z, this is the set of all, say, complex valued functions on the square such that, okay, okay. So I'm going to use this Fourier transform, all right? Um, and the point is just that this, the Fourier transform is a linear map and it's an isometry, okay? So now, here's what I'll do. Um, so it's a linear map and it's an isometry. So what it means is that, uh, let's just apply it in here. Okay, so how would applying it look? So let's write f hat for the Fourier transform of f. So, you know, okay. The Fourier transform is a linear isometry. So I can apply it, I can take hats in all these places and it's, none of the distances change. And it's linear so I can, I can distribute the hats. And then, uh, well, I don't take a hat here, but this condition is equivalent to, and I'll, I will see in just a second, that the Fourier transform vanishes at zero. That's the same thing as saying the expectation. The, the Fourier coefficient at zero is, uh, is zero, okay? So, so now, if you have this, and now here's a claim that I'll justify in a second, you need the fact that when you apply the Fourier transform to a shift, it's, also, it's a shift in the Fourier basis as well. So what does it mean? Uh, the claim is that this is the same thing as, I guess it turns out it's T inverse. And I'll, I'll argue this in a second, but let me finish the proof first. Okay. That, okay. The, the, my claim is this. We'll prove this in a second. Now with this in hand, we can just rewrite this. Um, so I'll rewrite it. Lambda 2 equals the minimum over f hat of so okay so sum over z in the lattice f of z minus f of t inverse z squared plus f of z minus, oh, there should be hats all over here. s inverse z squared divided by sum f hat squared subject to the constraint that f hat at 0 equals 0. OK? All right, so this is, so I'm, I'm just rewriting, so I, I took Fourier transforms. And then I use my claim to, to write that the Fourier transform of f hat s is actually just f hat composed with t inverse, OK? Now the point is that this is, I guess we could just write it. This is exactly the minimum Rayleigh quotient of f hat with respect to our original infinite graph uh, g on the integers, our, our graph that was, had edges defined by s and t subject to the constraint that this equals zero, okay? This is just the Rayleigh quotient of our original graph G, okay? But now we know that this is at least half by the lemma complying with the discrete Cheeger inequality. So the discrete Cheeger inequality says that for any, that the Rayleigh quotient of, so what does it say? The Rayleigh quotient of any F that vanishes at zero is at least the expansion of sets that don't, con is at least the, half times the square of the expansion of sets that don't contain zero. So this is half times one squared, where one is the expansion constant of sets that don't contain zero. OK. So, so I'll justify the claim in a second, but that's the, that's the proof. You prove this fact about the integer lattice, then uh, pass the finite graphs by taking quotients, move from your family of finite graphs to a single, just to the torus, okay? And then just apply Fourier transforms, and, and, the, and the, the problem you let, you're left with after you apply Fourier transforms is exactly the problem on this, on this lattice. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I think the proof is simple enough that you can actually remember it, like you could, you know, recall it later. So let, I guess let me just argue about, uh, let me just remind people, so here, I'll do it right here, what's going on. Uh, OK, so what does the Fourier transform look like? OK, so first of all, what's the Fourier basis? So for integers, 
m and n, you look at functions 2 pi i mx plus ny. That's the Fourier basis. Uh, and then the point is that you can write every f as a sum over m and n. The actual fact that this holds was not proved until, actually, I wish I remember the, the history of this. But I, m my feeling is that for functions of this form that are very, very simple, it's not too hard to show that. OK. So the point is you, you have this, you know, you can write any function in the Fourier basis where the, this Fourier coefficient is just the inner product of f and the Yeah. Right. But so we don't want anything like that. Right. Like, this is, we no, we just need the isometry. Okay? We yeah. just need the fact that this is an isometry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We just really need the fact that, yeah, this is a. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really simple, right? It's not just the, the fact that this is a Hilbert space and you have orthogonality of the characters. Okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, the isometry is the completeness of the space. So any function which is orthogonal to all the. Right. Yeah. It's not just well, the fact that these are orthogonal. But well, we don't even need that. We just need to match into L to the L to for this proof. Um, hey, hey, listen, none of it matters. I mean, even if you had some error, you can take the error to be epsilon and then take the epsilon to be zero. So you actually can just use, do everything with bounded error, right? I mean, it's like, OK, so. OK. Uh, so, so you disagree? The fact that the error goes to zero is equivalent to completeness. So that's. No, but the point proving that for this function the error goes to zero is, is darn near trivial. I mean, this function is like just a, it's like you can you can make it piecewise, you know, it's a very yeah. nice function. But, but the point Russ is making is there when you have the minimum over a packet. Yeah. Um, so suppose so, so the isometry fact is that the fact that the isometry is onto. No, you just, need, you just need to be injective, right? You need that everything here can be, can be. So I'm proving a strong, I'm proving that this minimum is large, which is stronger than proving that the image of this thing under the Fourier transform is large, right? But in any case, so now you can see that, you know, the, f the first Fourier coefficient is just, is just the integral of f because it, it's a constant function. And then what's the other fact you need to see? Just that if you take, if you compose one of, an element of the Fourier basis with f, then what you get is, is this, with s is, is this. Because now x gets replaced by x plus y, and so y picks up an m. And so you get that. Okay. And similarly, m plus n, n. Uh, and this implies um, that, well, okay, so what does it imply? So now look at the Fourier transform of F composed with S. This is sum over Nm of this, but now we have to write M, N plus M, and then just change the variables, and we get, we get this. So this is why... No, OK, so that proves this claim, that when you take the Fourier transform of f composed with s, then what you get is hat f composed with t inverse, and similarly for s. Okay? So it's really just a, yeah. These shifts just act as shifts in the Fourier basis. Uh, OK, that's the proof. Any questions? In particular, I'm curious to know whether people think that was simple. It's, it, it's not, we didn't do anything hard, right? So, so, so this thing about the lambda 2 of the torus must be some exercise in differential geometry books or something. No, well, I mean, th no, because this S and T, these are, these are not like a... Uh, oh, okay, this is not the, these are not standard. Yeah, no. these, are, these are some strange operators. I'm not sure what you, that you would want to... Consider those in like I mean they don't reflect the geometry of the I get I mean in some sense that's where the expansion the pseudorandomness comes from. How do you start with a two-dimensional object and get an expander? You have to have some operators that don't you know behave or not geometrically well behave. Right? These things jump across the space. 
It's just uh, Is it too specific to what you want to do for this? Okay. But, uh, okay, so that, that's, and it, it seems to be, I mean, you know, okay. At least if you, if you sort of, if this is second nature to you, then all the steps of the proof really just flow very nicely. Okay. Maybe, maybe you guys have a different opinion, but. I see it well that you, you sort of, Apply. I mean, you don't get your graph really as a quotient of z squared, but you take your graph, you approximate the torus with it, and then Fourier transform gets you to z squared. I mean. Yeah, so I mean, there's two points, right? The, the lattice, okay, z squared expands, and that's, you know, again, that's almost trivial just because, uh, right? So. In general, if you took the if you took the standard generators on the on the lattice, then of course you wouldn't you wouldn't have an expander because you know the boundary grows linearly and the volume goes quadratically. But here the the the, the boundary grows along with the size of the ball. So sort of you fix you're fixing it by you know making the boundary much thicker because you're taking these huge jumps. Uh, so this is sort of second nature. And and now the question you I guess you really want to ask is what when you take can any funny things happen when you take torsion so that somehow you get this miraculous thing where all of these jumps go to the same place. Uh, and once you get to here, I mean, this sort of says that nothing miraculous, I mean, this, this kind of says nothing miraculous is happening. Right? I mean, because there's no, the end doesn't play any kind of role. So yeah, there's two steps, right? Expa the expansion for z squared with these, with these uh, s and t operators, and then uh, the fact that wraparound doesn't hurt the expansion. Okay, so the fact that wraparound doesn't hurt the expansion, maybe that's still a little mysterious. I mean, it that you have to go via the function, right? Because you start off with just a combinatorial you know, expansion property, and that's what you end up with as well. So, so and in fact, you can, there's, there is another, there's another way to do the proof, actually, which is you could, you could, you could start with combinatorial expansion, you could maintain combinatorial expansion and just go to some kind of continuous expansion for sets in the torus. Um, that, that, that also works. I actually just think this is simpler because when you allow yourself arbitrary functions, you can just, it's actually a little bit easier than playing around with the sets to make sure they all line up. But then when you take Fourier transforms, eventually you get arbitrary functions again. So. So you can't say with sets the whole time, it seems. <coughs> so what does this have to do with uh, Margulis' formulation? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, I, the, this is one of the problems with his paper being in Russian and also inaccessible, which is that I, at some point I looked at it. No, no, there's an English translation, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but then every time I, I, you know, the past five times I tried to go back and look at Margulis's paper, I I couldn't get it, so I don't I no longer remember what. Uh, I mean, you know, you can see the matrices that correspond to S and T. The question is, uh, yeah. I I, I want to remember, so I'll tell you when I figure it out what the what Margulis's construction was and what the representation theoretic. Machinery. I mean, I guess it depends on whatever representation theoretic result he was using, whether he needed primes. But here, yeah, there are no primes, right? In the deduction from Kashigami property P of S of V, that was, that was not in? Yeah, so that is, that, that's, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Right, so I mean, in that sense, you can say it's. I actually don't know the history of this very well. Is, is he the one who observed that sort of Kajdan, T, and then you pass to quotients gives you expanders? Yeah. Okay. So Gabor Galil did this graph? Gabor Galil did this graph, but 
for various reasons, they took, instead of plus minus one, they took plus minus two. Just because when they did the Fourier analysis, it helped them have a square somewhere. So, uh, so uh, they did the same, okay, they, yeah, I mean, they did essentially the same thing, but, um, but now they analyzed, you know, they analyzed these, they didn't use a Chigrin, they didn't pass the sets to analyze the Fourier transform. They just analyzed it in the, you know. So the proof has a similar flavor where you sort of say that a function has to grow a certain amount of the time with, you know, two-thirds of the time, blah, blah, blah. But it's nothing, but it's, it's, a, it's a few pages of complex analysis. You know, I mean, not complex analysis, but it's, you know, you, you see things like bounding characters, and then there's a square, and there's like, the, oh, we have to make this square there to have a trick in the Fourier analysis. So it's, you know, anytime you have Fourier analysis, it's a little subtle when you just have sequences of inequalities that work out. It's, it's nice that... And, and in, the, in the discrete case, you're completely screwed, because you can't, I mean, you can't get rid of the torsion. So, so again, you can do something which simulates sort of what happens in the continuous case, but you can't get something this pretty if you take... Discrete trigger inequality, uh, you get down to, s to finite sets. So, so somehow, uh, because uh, the lemma one works because you are only looking at finite sets, so they, uh, they are open to the outside and you get lots of edges going, going out. And no, but uh, even here you'd be bounded in L2, so you would essentially be finite. I mean, you can. Even if you end, if you weren't going to use discrete trigger, you're just yeah. going to operate. So, yeah, so, but then you get this. This is a construction by Zook. Or combinatorial. Go on. It's supposed to be elementary proofs of this type of for, for the ZN? I don't, I mean, I, you know, I, I, at some point, a couple, few months ago, I looked through everyone's lectures notes everywhere and tried to find a simple proof. And in fact, I should say that Lemma 1, this is, there is a paper of Linnell in London which uh, considers the same problem but for continuous sets in the plane. And this, this proof, you know, it's very simple, but this proof is essentially an observation of Z. Veer about their paper. Uh, but it's very, yeah. But the point is, the complicated parts in all the other proof really are lemma one. It's just a lemma one plus the Chigger inequality. That's what, yeah, so, all right. Any other comments or questions? No, it's fine. James?